Hello, John Terrell here. Pull a chair up to the fireside at Chateau Cube, where we discuss life, limited magic, and cube draft. Andy Mangold joins us today. Andy is the founder of Lucky Paper, a blog devoted to cube. He writes extensively there, as do many other friends with whom I have had the pleasure of working, such as Parker, aka Land of Mordor, and Jet Crowdis. Andy Mangold and Anthony Maddox co-host the really excellent Cube podcast, Lucky Paper Radio, where I have had the privilege of serving as a guest. Andy is a really wonderful, welcoming voice in the Cube community. As we mentioned here, when I ventured onto the Discord chat platform for the first time and asked a Cube question, it was Andy who greeted me and with whom I had a delightful discussion that sold me on Discord. I can chat with Andy for hours. And in fact, our conversation this evening is so expansive that I have divided it up into two podcasts. In part one, we have a rather abstract conversation about our approaches to cube design and why we believe magic is so gripping a pastime for us. In fact, Anthony exhorts me at the outset to carry on an entire conversation without mentioning any single magic card. But I am afraid that I rather quickly insist that he abandon that challenge. We each lay out the metaphors that guide how we think about a cube designer's aims and responsibilities. Join us next week for part two, which I am really excited to share with you. There, Andy describes a new cube format that he has developed, which is quite innovative and extremely powerful. But I'm sworn to secrecy and I can't tell you anything about it just yet. I am delighted to welcome Andy Mangold to Chateau Cube. I would love to try and have this entire episode of this podcast go by without us reciting the rules text of a card. To me, actually, like magic is not exciting because of the details of the cards. I mean, I certainly have cards that I like, right? And there's, I have a little bit of a collector magpie in me. But what I actually like about magic, what is exciting and thrilling to me about magic is the kind of abstract framework, the system of it. I have come to realize in my adult life that one of the things that is consistent through all of my interests and everything that I love and pursue is a passion for the underlying systems at play in in the world. Uh, I'm very interested in politics, for example, because I think it's very interesting that we as a group of citizens of 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 a politic, of a country, of a state, come together and try and figure out some way to put into place some rules, some systems, some best practices, some sort of culture to make everyone's life better, to enrich the life of everybody in a, in a sort of, you know, area, in a, in a political group. That's a very interesting idea to me. What are the things that you can do in an abstract way to make everyone's existence better, right? And in my in my professional work, I, I am a web designer for a living, a web designer and a web engineer. And so I spend a lot of time building websites and thinking very concretely about how if you make this button a little bigger or make it this color versus that color or use this language versus is this other language in a certain navigational element, you get to affect the behavior of this big like bell curve of people on this on this website, right? Like the decisions you make have this subtle influence over what people actually do on the website, you know, whether they buy one thing or 10 things or whether they, you know, fill out their tax form correctly or incorrectly or whatever the sort of task is you're working on. The same is true for me for magic, right? Like that's my, my hobby, right? Like one of my, my, my biggest hobby by far is magic. And if you were to take a passion for systems and for understanding the world as this complex place where everything is governed by this overlapping web of forces, then you of course arrive at magic instead of playing, uh, I sometimes play Super Smash Brothers casually, right? Like I think it's fun to go like blow off some steam and, and play a video game here and there. And there's certainly I'm sure video games that cater to this same kind of systems thinking that I'm describing here. What really excites me about magic is thinking about it as this abstract framework for understanding the world and like interacting interacting in with with other human beings in this very dynamic and like I think kind of profound way that I think mirrors all of my interest in other things in life mirrors what I do for a living mirrors my interest in politics it's just I love thinking about these abstract systems and how they can influence people one way or another and to me that's what cube design is right like designing a cube is taking all of these tools all of these moving parts we have access to in magic and putting them into a context where you are basically going to affect people's behavior. You're going to affect the cards they're going to take in a draft, the cards they're going to play. You're going to affect all of these things in these subtle ways. And building a system like that is a very satisfying intellectual problem for me. And that is what keeps me coming back to Cube and keeps me coming back to magic. Yeah, 
I can totally see that. And it's, it allows you to build a system that then allows others to build systems within it, right? Using the building blocks that you've provided them. So that's super cool too. And, and in some ways, it's actually the politics analogy, I think is very, feels very relevant to me because what is most exciting to me about Cube specifically, or any other really sandbox environment where I'm deciding on the context in which other players will enter it and then play is that I'm kind of setting up this system with these parameters and what then with limitations on what it'll allow or not not allow. But then the magic happens when somebody else brings an entirely different perspective and value set to that same system and tries to execute their values within that system, right? Like and that's that's what politics is, right? You have we have this abstract system that like we all try and somehow agree on through some form of mildly democratic processes or very mildly in this country. Then every individual citizen, every individual, you know, actor within that system brings their own value and basically approaches it and tries to maximize their own individual benefit, right? So you build a cube and then someone comes in and drafts some deck. Maybe I didn't intend for them to draft or, you know, sees cards very differently than I do, evaluates them differently. I think a lot of designers would look at that and try to solve it in the sense that they would try and, you know, design an environment they fully understood. It's like they, they want to have like kind of a full understanding and control over their environment and know what the optimal strategy is and know what you're supposed to do in any given situation. I don't think that's possible. And I really embrace the fact that that's not, that's not the way that Cube works for me. Like I, I want people to come in and bring their own values to something. And something I was mentioning on Twitter the other day is that I really love including cards in my Cube that players in my play group or the community at large vehemently disagree on, right? Like I have some cards in my cube that people, some people insist are unplayable. You shouldn't touch them in a cube of my power level. It's just a trap and total garbage. And other people who insist are pack one, pick one material every single time. Both of these people, yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't think and one is either right or wrong. Truthfully, I think the correct answer is probably somewhere in the middle. It's right. Like, I think that they're, they're probably both a little bit on the extremes, but I love including that because it allows somebody to come to my cube. And I, I've basically try to set a table for them where people can actually pursue what it is they like about magic to some degree, instead of it just being what I think the ideal unpowered cube environment is. That analogy of that to like a political system, I think is very apt for me because I don't want to live in a political system where the government prescribes what's right for everybody, but I want to live in a system where there is a band of what is acceptable. And within that band, people are able to pursue their own, their own ends, basically. Can you give us any example of the sorts of cards that may encourage that strong reaction in people, this diversity of opinion you're talking about? Ah, uh, sure. 10 minutes in, you'll get me to read some card names. You, we'll, we'll go there. I'm not, I'm not going to make my rule dogmatic. Yeah, so one of them is uh, Crater Hoof Behemoth. That's a great example of a card that people that are champions of the kind of more mid-rangey, leaner green decks, which I know you are and I actually am too, kind of insist that you shouldn't put an eight mana card in a cube deck where there's all this cheap interaction floating around. You're just begging for it to get counterspelled or discarded from your hand or something. And some people are like, this is the only card that matters in green decks. Uh, and I have some very good players in my play group that maintain that that is the only card that matters for your green deck. And that's what you need to get if you want to win the draft to have a functional green deck. I read that card kind of low in my own environment, but there are still players that think it's like pack on pickle material. And I'm more than happy to include it for them. And truthfully, that's the only big green card I include. Like the rest of my green section is almost indistinguishable from somebody that is truly supporting the mid-range green, right? I don't have any green six drops. I don't have any green seven drops. I don't have any green nine, 10 or 11 drops. The only thing I have above five in green is Crater Hoof Behemoth. That's it. But that's enough for somebody to be like, that's the kind of green deck I want to draft. All in mana dorks and green sun zenith and Crater Hoof Behemoth and just make that deck happen. That's an example of a card that I think is very polarizing in its opinion. Like people have very strong opinions about it one way or the other. And for that reason, I won't cut it anytime soon, even though it, you know, it's maybe not, you know, what I'm most excited about in that particular color, because I'm just, you know, one person. If it only takes one card for some people to be excited about a color they would otherwise not be interested in, then sure, you know, prove me wrong. Be like, kill people with creative behemoth. And it still happens. I mean, it kills people dead for sure. Right. That's part of the politics that we have to navigate as cube designers, deciding how far we want to pay deference to our players' wishes and desires and what they want to be doing and how far we want to not only support our own design philosophy, but also try to manage players' experience so that we're not leading them down the garden path into uh, traps, leading them into strategies that we think are going to be unsuccessful. Partially supported combo decks are a terrible idea. And in my opinion. If you don't have enough components for people to reliably get there, then that's a problem. Even if people love playing that storm deck, but it's just too hard to reliably put storm together, I'd prefer to leave it by the wayside. 
Yeah, and this negotiation you mentioned between your playgroup's preferences and your own preferences, and some people say they want something, and how do you give them what they want while still maintaining an environment that is within your own values and represents what you want your cube to represent? I, like I said, I build websites for a living, and what this field is called in a abstract sense is product design is what the, is the name for it, which is a relatively new field. So the websites I design are mostly not, you know, a website for a coffee shop where it just has a menu and their location and not to minimize the design of a website for a coffee shop, but you know, it's purely informational because there's a bunch of websites that are basically purely informational. And for the design of a purely informational website, that field can lean on 50, 60, 70 years of history of graphic design and typography and typesetting to learn how to make information uh, laid out in a sensible way so people can understand it and read it. There's less novelty in designing a purely informational website than there is in designing a website that is somehow interactive. And that's what I mean when I refer to product design. So if you're designing an application you sign into, it's your email application, it's your social media network, it's, you know, your bank, uh, you know, website, something you log into that has some actions you can perform, you can submit forms, you can click buttons that do stuff. That's product design. And this field is relatively young. There have been websites that have been interactive since websites existed, but it's a relatively recent thing that we have this term for. I mean, that term is probably only on the order of like eight, nine years old. I don't think I've ever heard anybody referred to as a product designer earlier than that. It being like a career you could pursue to like design interactive web interfaces and study them in an academic way is also, you know, not that old, 15 years, maybe something like that. Because our, this industry is relatively new and we're operating in kind of uncharted waters, we oftentimes rely on other like adjacent industries to learn from. There's actually not as much to learn from graphic design, for example, uh, about product design as there is to learn from something like architecture. Architecture is a much better analog for building websites because you're building a big space that people are going to come into with some purpose. They're going to interact with it in some way and there's going to be navigation and wayfinding and your goal is basically to like move people through this space and accomplish their goals and whatever to whatever end you're trying to accomplish them. So, you know, you might design an e-commerce website with similar underlying philosophies as you would design a shopping mall where like the goal is to make people walk past a lot of products, you know, to get to the cash register, which is in the middle of the store, because the more products they walk past, the more chance they'll see something they want and dump it in their cart. And the exact same is true for an e-commerce website, right? There's just constantly related products. You add something to your cart and it's like people also bought this. Right, it's the exact same kind of underlying philosophy. Similarly, I think like a well-designed, you know, banking website should be designed to get you in and out, let you do the thing you need to do, and inspire confidence. Right, like make you trust that your money's being taken well care of, and you know, just feel like everything is secure. And so, because we have to lean on other industries for this kind of underpinnings, and because architecture is so often referenced, there is a, a documentary that I was shown in my my program in college called Citizen Architect, and it's a very small documentary. I'm, I'm, I'd be shocked if anybody listening has ever heard or seen in this documentary, but it basically follows a an architect named Samuel Mockby, who ran this program out of the University of Auburn, where he basically took architecture students and dropped them into communities of disadvantaged poor people and had these architecture students design and build structures for those people, houses and buildings for the community. Basically, just like the idea was completely immerse architecture students with the people that are going to be living in the buildings they're going to build and have them learn about architecture in that way. And in the documentary, Samuel Mockby is this very kind of generous, spirited guy who obviously wants to like do good in his community. He wants to help the disadvantaged people. And he also wants to teach architects to grow up and be moral, upstanding, you know, good people that also understand their career and can pursue it, pursue it with, with clear eyes and, you know, a, a, an eye towards helping the world a little bit. And his foil in the documentary is, is this other architect. This, this guy is like a, a classic modernist architect. And there's a, there's a quote from him in the movie that, you know, I, I saw this movie 15 years ago or whatever. And this quote is forever, forever stuck with me because this guy says in the movie, he's like, you know, I've designed all kinds of buildings. I've designed, you know, housing projects for poor people that were very successful and everyone loved them. And he's like, I don't think I have to talk to the people that are going to live in my buildings. I don't think it matters what they want because they're not the architect. I'm the architect. I've studied this. I, I understand what I'm doing. I'm a professional. And so like talking to them doesn't give me any additional insight into making a building that's successful that serves the goals that I'm trying to serve, which in the context of this documentary comes off extraordinarily callous, right? Like there's this like rich architect guy with his like, you know, black turtleneck uh, and his like fancy glasses saying, I don't want to talk to poor people. I'll design houses for them, but I don't need to talk to them, right? It's not important for me. And so when you first see that, your reaction is just like, oh, what a, like, what a, 
what a jerk is, is, yeah. is what you think when you first see him. But then you think about it a little more and you're like, well, wait a minute. He does seem like a jerk. But at the same time, he did study architecture for a long time. He is practiced at this. Like if studying architecture for 20 or 30 years doesn't give you more insight into how to build a successful building than just being a person that can say what you want, what is the relationship here? Like, like how do you like what's why is this worth studying if anybody can just go make a building that meets their needs and all of a sudden it's as good as an architect could build, right? Like why do we even have architecture as a field if that's the case. And so it proposes this very interesting dichotomy of somebody who has the very modernist perspective of I am the, the studied professional. I have researched this and, and practiced and honed my craft and therefore I can deliver an excellent good. I, 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 I can do my job with extreme competence and what I create will be amazing. Versus somebody who is being very humble and just saying like, well, yeah, sure, I've studied things, but it's really important that I understand the audience that I'm working for. I can't make successful work without that additional information, like everything else, I think ultimately the actual result is in there. But I actually, I've been working on an article that who knows if it'll ever come out. I have so many stubs of half-written articles. You've, you've helped, you've proofread a couple of them for me that I haven't, that haven't come out yet. But there's an article I have written up, which is what I've been working on, which is trying to relate this theory to cube design. Because again, I see that as almost exactly the same, right? Like I see these kind of competing ideologies in the cube community. There are some people that feel like as the cube designer, it is my job to understand this environment completely, to know which the the best cards are, which the worst cards are. And if somebody comes in and doesn't understand that and drafts a bad deck, like I made my, I made my great cube, like whatever, like I, I did my thing I was supposed to do. And there's other people, I think on the other end of the extreme that are like, well, I'm just trying to make my play group happy. What do I know? I'm just a cube designer. I'm just going to like, if someone says I like a card or this is their favorite card, I'm just kind of included all. And in reality, I think what being a true designer is and what the, na the, the namesake of a documentary, Citizen Architect, is being a little bit of both, right? Like being a citizen and also being an architect. And when it comes to Cube, it's about being a player, understanding the role of a player, listening to what your players have to say, but then processing that and digesting it and working it into your worldview so you're not just acting as their hands. You're not just taking dictation from them and playing the cards they want to play, but you are processing the feedback and understanding it and putting it through a framework of what you're trying to accomplish. And that's where you apply your expertise, right? It's not that you sit in an ivory tower and make the perfect cube and you do all your hypergeometric calculations, you make everything perfect. It's that you are balancing all of these inputs and trying to make sense of them and sort of process them in a way that is productive. And, and to me, that is the job of a designer in basically every context is processing a wide variety of oftentimes conflicting inputs and turning that into something that is productive. It's really fun to do that for Magic because Magic's a fun game and you know, I do it for work too and that's also fun too, but it's not as fun as playing, as playing Magic, so. Today we recognize the important work being done by a charitable organization that Andy champions, the Sunrise Movement. Sunrise is devoted to stopping climate change as an urgent existential priority. Furthermore, they promote research that aims to create new, sustainable, high-paying jobs in green technologies. Work is organized not only on a national level in the U.S., but a real emphasis is put on local engagement. Hence, Sunrise boasts more than 400 offices around the country. I am donating all of my Google ad revenue since my last podcast to the Sunrise Movement. Visit sunrisemovement.org for more information. I like that analogy, and I like that you are promoting a sort of synthesis of these two extremes. You've presented a kind of thesis and antithesis, right? These two dichotomous views that you're describing. And I'm with you that at least I personally want to find some balance between the two. I guess I was kind of alluding to this in a small way in the last video I did about different ways of soliciting feedback about one's cube. And I was talking about lots of different strategies for going about that. But in the section wherein I focus on the player experience, I talk about different ways of trying to get players feedback. But also I talk about my love of sort of sitting out the cube as well. So I enjoy being in the trenches and getting my hands dirty playing the cube, you know, sitting around the table. But I think there's also a huge amount to be gained from sitting back and working in a more reporterly, observational kind of mode and seeing what people are doing and how people are reacting, which may be different from what people are telling me after the draft Absolutely. You know, about what their experience is. 
that is a that's a key tenet of any kind of user testing too. So if you're designing a website, there is a it's completely different to do some kind of survey and ask an audience of people what they think about something, which there's totally times where that's appropriate. But that is one kind of gathering information. And another is actually looking at behavior, whether it's in the aggregate, you're looking at, you know, analytics that show you which buttons are clicked most or whatever, or you're actually watching a user session. And you can either do that by, you know, scheduling an actual user testing session where you have somebody like on a screen share, or there are some analytic services where you can actually like use JavaScript to recreate a session of somebody. You can see where they clicked on and how long they were on pages and kind of where their mouse went. And so you can watch someone interact with something and you learn a completely different set of things. And if you were to ask that person, like, you know, what do you care about? And you know, what's most important to you? And do you care that this has free shipping or not? There's a lot of, there's a lot of biases and things that people are not conscious of or can't articulate that come through when you observe behavior that does not come through when you ask people what they want. When you were talking about website design and you had the comparison to architectural design as some touchstone, it made me think about another touchstone for me when it comes to sculpting user experience. This one has to do with web design, but it's a more narrative one. I don't know if you remember this phenomenon, but in probably the mid 90s, there was something that was championed as an entirely new genre of literature, which was hypertext fiction. And I think it was made possible through, there was a application on Macintosh that was called HyperCard or something, possibly. Yeah, HyperCard is a is a often referenced piece of software in the user design, user experience community. Oh, really? Oh, that's super cool. I didn't know that was still a thing or that was a thing that people talk about. It was viewed as, I, I never interacted with it. I was, I think, too young to, you know, be playing around on a Mac at that time. But people refer to it as like this very groundbreaking and iconic, like step forward for how people thought about interaction design. It was, a, yeah, it was a super cool thing. So there was lots of really interesting, innovative literature for a period of time there in the mid to late 90s where people were experimenting with cards. And the idea of HyperCard was, as I recall it, you just create series of screens that have some index associated with them. And then you can create hyperlinks on these screens that just jump to another card, right? That jump to another screen on the index. And then as this became slightly more advanced, you could start adding graphical assets to the cards and so on. So people developed these sort of like choose your own adventure novels, but they were increasingly innovative and complex. There's one particularly famous one called Patchwork Girl by Shelley Jackson. And I haven't looked at this thing in years, but I remember <laughs> the, I mean, the real impression it made on me. It was a sort of feminist pastiche of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. You're sort of playing the role of the protagonist who's this girl who is constructing herself over the course of the story. So as you're, you know, choosing where you're going and choosing where you're linking to in the story, you know, you're in the process of discovering your own identity and constructing your own body. And there's this real corporeal element to it. You're sort of corporealizing yourself through the interface. My background is in English and in English literature. So just as you're thinking about cube design through the sort of web design lens and product design lens and so on, I tend to think of cube design in narrative terms and in the experience of playing cube in narrative terms. So for me, there's some flavor of that hypertext fiction in cube design, whereby I'm creating all of these hypercards, which for me are interlinked in myriad ways. And what I'm trying to offer my players, at least in part, is an experience of creating their own story through navigating the draft table, for instance, and interlinking these cards themselves and discovering new interconnections between the cards and then constructing a sort of Frankenstein's monster, not in a negatively charged way, but, you know, in like assembling something that has its own life to it and its own movement to it. Right. I mean, sometimes I think about just how many conceivable outcomes there are, even just to a draft, right? Like sit down, you're going to get past these packs. How many different choices could you make along the way in terms of cards you chose that would, how many different decks could you end up with at the end of the draft? And the number is already mind boggling. And then you think about every individual game, you're going to shuffle up your deck, your opponent's going to shuffle up theirs, you're going to draw an opening seven, you're going to decide on mulligans, you're going to decide how to sequence your plays. Yeah, like in some ways, like magic from a narrative sense is like the most complicated branching truth your adventure ever and you know the outcome of your adventure is you either win or lose based on the decisions you made 
each decision in isolation is a relatively simple decision, right? Here's 15 cards, choose one. Here's 14 cards, choose a second. None of the decisions individually is super complicated, but in their aggregate, of course, they're enormously complicated and, you know, result in just so many possible outcomes. And to me, that's part of the magic of Cube is that you can make a relatively simple decisions of I put these 360 cards together. But what happens, what unfolds immediately from that is this just incredible world of possibility of, of every conceivable combination of all those cards and possible decks and game states and all the things that could potentially happen that it's just so exciting. It's so exciting to me to make those small decisions. And you, you feel like you pack the Cube with all of this like potential energy and then as soon as you draft it it's just like burst onto the table yeah that's a super cool thing people have asked me about why i chose the name cultic cube which is a an infelicitous name in many ways because <laughs> it's so hard to parse uh for people when i say it you know cultic cube they're like cult of cube i was trying to evoke the experience of cube which for me is all about the sort of mystery this awe-inspiring grandeur that is cube not only in the play experience but also in the design experience when i sit down at a draft table for instance i feel like i have that whole world of possibility that you're describing that is there that's entirely potential energy yet and then I'm beginning to explore this sort of primordial forest as I begin cracking packs and then trying to figure out what's going on and how to how to navigate this. And I'm being um, confronted with these just awe-inspiring plays and creatures and spells. There's a kind of magic to it, but it's also a magic that has its own logic governing it, has its own rules governing it. Part of what I really like about magic specifically, I mentioned that I like it because it's a framework, I think, to explore ideas that are interesting to me. Because as much as I'm interested in politics, politics, I don't think, is a super appropriate context for like radical experimentation, right? Not only am I not in a position of power to do any kind of radical experimentation in politics, but there are real stakes, right? You can't just say, what if we tried, you know, doing this dramatically different uh, way of distributing wealth or, you know, abolishing all private property and doing something like this, right? You could, those kinds of experiments uh, have really sort of important stakes tied to them. And to me, magic is a world that is deep enough and rich enough in how complicated the system is and how many varieties of ways there are to play that there is a almost equal amount of stuff to explore, but the stakes are much lower. So like, I find that I can have conversations with my friends about their values with magic as a kind of a vessel. Magic as a vessel to discuss something important, like the values for how you determine whether you know something or not, right? Like it can be very charged to talk to a friend about, you know, how much they will or will not trust the COVID-19 vaccine based on whatever sort of data or talk to a friend about whether they believe or don't believe in a God. But you can have, I think, very similar conversations that get at the same values by talking to somebody about why they think this card is good or bad or, you know, what they think makes this deck successful or not successful. You get to have conversations about big ideas about epistemology and about how you feel like you know what you know, right? Like, like what constitutes knowledge? How do you how do you define a good card? Like, what does tempo mean to you? Like those conversations are big conversations, and I I get bored by <laughs> by little conversations, right? Like I, uh, I I like everybody have my things to unwind. I'll, I'll go play Smash Brothers and just you know mash some buttons for a while. Uh, but, but I I don't like watching TV really. Like I I get bored watching TV. I just it's not enough to like keep me engaged. I just my mind wanders, and then I don't appreciate the TV show as much as I should because I can't focus on it completely. It's just I really love magic as an as an outlet for something you. Can get deeply invested in and then have very real meaningful conversations about it but it's this kind of safe thing at a distance not to say that magic players don't get extremely invested and personally offended based on you know what you say about a magic card i think honestly like the amount that people get worked up about magic is evidence to this right like it's it shows you how important and like profound some of the conversations can be because people have their entire self-worth wrapped up in whether or not you think their card evaluation is right or whether their deck is cool in a certain format right people get really heated about it because it is this proxy for much deeper values than we normally talk about in polite society, right? Polite social life. Yeah, that's true. I guess it's a place where it's safer to have stronger, more heated opinions as well in that the stakes are so much lower when it comes right down to it in, you know, magic discussions than in discussions of politics or of human rights and that sort of thing, you know? I find it's really important to remind people often in the magic community <laughs> how low the stakes really are. 
because yeah. boy, people will just get oof. They will get really invested. And, and I have some people in my local play group for whom I know like magic is one of the only good things going for them. You know, like they, they've got a hard life for whatever reason. And magic is their like one outlet. And so I try to be sympathetic when people get upset about something because I try to put myself in the shoes of somebody who maybe this is the one thing they got going. Right. And then for that to go wrong, for someone to tell them this one thing they got going, they're all wrong about or they, they think they're being silly about it can be really harmful and hurtful. So I, I try to I try to keep that perspective while also understanding that, like, if you're going to fly off the handle about everything that Watsy does, <laughs> it's going to be it's like it's real. It's a real boy who cried wolf situation. If magic had crumbled uh, as many times as all of the clickbaity YouTube titles would lead you to believe that uh, Wizards was destroying magic, then it would have died a long time ago. And yet it persists. So stakes are low, which is what I like about it. But it's not so low that people don't care. People really care about it. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about magic. The first time I ever got on any Discord, I'd never even heard of this phenomenon. This was maybe three years ago or something, and it was the MTG Cube Talk Discord. And you were the very first person with whom I interacted. And I asked about Siege Rhino. I got it right here, John. You said, uh, I have included Siege Rhino in my unpowered 540 by user request, but it doesn't seem to actually be good to me. Opinions on it. Would you ever splash it, for instance? If it only goes in junk bin range, card doesn't seem worth the slot. And indeed, here I am responding. So yeah, you're right. This was uh, August of 2018. So actually not that long ago. It feels like so much longer ago, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. So that was just over two years ago, because we're Oof. in November 2020 for, for anybody who wants to keep score here. It, it feels like it was a lot longer. I feel like uh, <laughs> yeah. time has been doing some weird, freaky stuff uh, yeah. for the past couple of years. And it yeah, has. that feels like it was a lot longer ago for sure. I'm charmed and delighted that we are having not the same conversation now, but it's a conversation in a similar vein whereby we're talking about what deference we pay to our players' will and, you know, how it's true to our own vision as designers and so on. You know? It's been a long time and you and I are in very different positions now than we were with with regards to the Cube community. And yet we're yeah. still talking about whether or not we care about our one player that really wants to play Siege Rhino and how much we're going <laughs> to yeah. listen to them, right? Yeah. Right. We had a little talk about it and you were like, you know, if your people want Seed Rhino, give them the Seed Rhino. I, yeah, I said I have a whole thing, but then I said, that said, I said give the people what they want usually. And indeed, I gave them Seed Rhino for, I don't know, a few months. And then I was <laughs> for, like, for a little longer. That's, that's it, you guys. Not yeah. forever. No, let's get this three colored nonsense out of here. Yeah, the, the online communities have been very important to me. I've always been extremely online for my entire adult life and even young adult life. And yeah, having these communities is like, I've spent so much more time. I mean, probably an order of magnitude more time talking about Cube online than I have playing Cube, certainly, or, you know, doing any anything that resembles playing Magic. And so th that's a big part of what Cube is to me, right? It's this community of people that are interested in talking about this abstract format, which can be whatever you want it to be, right? Like, I've never been part of a community that was talking about modern or... You know, I guess I'm kind I follow like, you know, some of the limited stuff, like limited resources and that subreddit. And I'll chat over there about the latest limited set. I feel like those conversations are all very different, right? Because they are driven by this desire to like solve whatever it is you're working on. Like there is some correct answer. What is the best deck in modern? What's the best deck position for the meta right now? How do I craft my cyborg just right? And you're trying to get at one semi-objective solution, even though you won't be able to ever actually prove that you found it, right? But there is theoretically an objective correct answer out there. And Cube is not, right? Every single person that comes to this Discord in any Cube community has their own entirely unique goal sets that might overlap some with others, might not. We have to talk about things in this labored, abstract way, which causes problems a lot, right? Because a lot of times people want to come in and be like, this card's bad in cube. And it's like, well, hold on, pump the brakes. <laughs> well, what does a card being bad in cube even mean when we're talking about this thing in an abstract sense? And yeah, sometimes I think people get annoyed at the kind of care to take into their tone, or you might say policing of their tone to like not be dogmatic about what cube is. That's what's like that friction is what makes this format beautiful to me that that we we are constantly having those reframing conversations about like always providing context and being aware that we are trying to talk about these things in a complicated abstract contextual way as opposed to just saying well this card is bad in modern right you're never going to play 
Colossal Dread Maul in Modern. It's just no good. There are cubes where Colossal Dread Maul is great, and there are cubes where Colossal Dread Maul is unplayable, and so we have to talk about things from this layer of remove, which comports with my desire to understand the world abstractly from a layer of remove, right? Like, I don't like looking at the results of things, right? I like to look at the, the underlying forces, and so... You know, the constant contextualization that's necessary before we can even have a conversation about our cubes is super important. This is something that I always try to stress in my own work when I'm giving people advice about how to solicit advice and so on, or just how to talk to other people about cube design, because obviously it causes so much friction when people get to arguing about cards or strategies and they're coming from two totally different places. Yeah, it's really difficult. And I, I almost feel like it's like people speaking different languages. But again, to me, like the whole the whole value of like why it's worth talking about cube is overcoming that or trying to overcome that or making some attempt to like bridge that gap. There's not there's nothing interesting to me to be learned about just putting up your walls and staking out your position and being like, here's what I care about and what I think of this world as much as there is to try and reach out and understand other people and come to some common terms on that layer of abstraction that exists above the actual cards you're running and why. So this contextualization is necessary, but it's also difficult because there's so many moving parts to what a cube is. Cube can be so many things, as you were just quite rightly saying. And we've had lots of attempts to define cubes. In our tiny circle, we all know the Strix scale that Parker, aka Land of Mordor, developed, uh, you know, whenever this was, a year, a year and a half ago now. So that is a valiant attempt to give us a language for defining cube, and I think it's useful. It's useful if you know the strict scale, though. So then we need like acolytes of the strict scale to disseminate the information if it's going to be useful to a broad audience. I've been talking lately with Ryan Sachs, who developed the AI recommender for Cube Cobra. This isn't something that entered into the recent video project I did with him. Ooh, behind the scenes goodies. Yeah, yeah. But one of the things I was chatting about with him as a potential outgrowth of the recommender would be an AI generated schematization of cubes that would develop, I don't know what we would call them, something like psychotypes, you know, the Jenny and Johnny type stuff um, that Mario has. That's probably, psychotype probably doesn't make any sense in this context, but develop 10 different like broad categories or something right. that we could drop cubes into and then give them names or whatever the, whatever the thing is. I don't know how useful that would be. And this isn't a thing that exists right now, but that would be, I, I could see that being a super interesting project and one that might largely sidestep the problem of people um, trying to affix a number, an objective number to the subjective experience of power level in scare quotes of the cube or whatever that might be. I mean, this is a problem EDH, as I understand it, struggles with as well. People try to introduce these systems of ranking the power level of EDH decks and so on. Yeah, but even that is a is a whole order of magnitude simpler because those EDHX are competing on the same terms, right? They are playing in the same context. So, you know, theoretically, you could objectively look at all a million EDH decks on EDH rec and you could, you know, say, all right, well, if you put them all against each other in 100,000 games and, you know, played all the matches and let some AI like, you know, play all these things out, you could find the ones that were better or not. We have spent a lot of time over at uh, Lucky Paper discussing recently just how we could make any kind of attempt at defining power level just enough so we could write an article about how you might consider it for your cube. So I mean, there's some very intuitive things that I think are hard for new players to grasp. Like if you're playing at a higher power level, you have fewer viable options of cards than at a lower power level, right? Like if you have a lower power level, there's just more choices for you to have. There's only one lightning bolt, but there's a hundred, you know, three mana, you know, burn spells that do three damage or whatever. To even like talk about those, those very concrete ideas, to even just write a sentence that describes what power level is, is a, is a super complicated task. And this is where I think your kind of history in literature, I think is a very relevant precedent because I honestly think comparing two cubes is kind of like comparing two novels and it's like I mean yeah they both got pages they both got words in them but you know we've got whole different value systems in play here and of course across all of time and history there are a myriad ways to 
organizing categorized literature, right? Or any kind of story, right? Everybody has their like cube, which like some people have the hero's journey and some people have the, you know, the series of vignettes or whatever, or the stories in parallel, the kind of thing going on. And there's a lot of commonality, right? Like there's a lot you can learn from chunks of the cube, synergies between cards, sections and strategies that overlap. We are not speaking completely different. Like I, I used the language as a metaphor earlier. Now I'm going to completely throw it under the bus. We're not speaking different languages for the most part. We're all speaking the language of magic, but there's just whole different underpinnings and frameworks for how we're using those tools. And so what we get to talk about is like those tropes, right? Let's talk about, you know, what what it means to have a, a tempo deck. Let's talk about how you support aggro and how that's relative to the other cards in your environment. Let's talk about what density of removal means for what other cards are viable. And those lessons, those things are what are transportable and, you know, they apply across time and memoriam, right? Like you can find cube articles from 15 years ago that go over the best green cards in cube and they're completely useful to you. It was, it's not at all useful to, to see the best green cards in Cube 15 years ago. We're living in a whole different world. But some article about the tropes, right? This level of theory applied on top of the actual cards themselves, that is meaningful. If, if you can construct a coherent idea from the abstraction that holds up to scrutiny and can be applied in multiple contexts, that to me is the beauty of Cube. And yes, when we have people colliding in these spaces, you have somebody that lives entirely in their own environment, which is the, the product of their own value values and that butts up against somebody else's values. And if they're not already thinking in this abstract way, then you just have this grading of like, well, why aren't you playing this card? That card's essential. You need to be playing this card. Or, you know, you've got way too many five drops. Like, why are you doing running so many five drops? And we get these kind of very small, petty discussions about the minutia like that instead of a broader understanding of the driving forces behind all those decisions. Thanks to Andy for joining us today, and don't forget to tune in next week for the conclusion of our conversation, wherein Andy introduces his new cube format to us. 